Conservation Ag Update is brought to you by Yokohama. Welcome to Conservation Ag Update. I'm Noah Newman, Technology Editor. Great to have you with us as always. A dual purpose perennial crop is showing major promise in the U.S. Well, that story coming up in just a bit. But we begin with new research on herbicide-resistant weeds. The University of Wisconsin Cropping Systems Weed Science team hosted a water hemp management field day in Brooklyn, Wisconsin this past week, highlighting some of its studies in 2023. Now, one project in particular sparked some concern over a growing population of herbicide-resistant water hemp in Dodge County, Wisconsin. Graduate student Felipe Faleco completed a greenhouse experiment that showed water hemp still emerged even after being sprayed at two times the recommended rate of different pre- and post-emergent herbicides like Flexstar and Valor EC. Wisconsin wheat scientist Rodrigo Worley puts it all in perspective. Uh, the PPO herbicides are our foundation for residual control of big weeds. And what Felipe is documenting here is PPO resistant water hemp in the sense that the residual herbicides are not lasting as long as they should have. Okay, having a pre have a water hemp emerge right through a one x or eight fluid ounces of Spartan to me that's really really scary. Okay, these herbicides are meant to give us six seven weeks of residual control, and you're not getting that right off the bat. It's really really concerning. More coverage from the event and details on those studies coming soon to notillfarmer.com. Sad news to report now, Keith Saxton, a champion for no-till and the cross-slot no-till opener design, has passed away at the age of 85 after battling health issues over the last several years. He became the first person to bring the cross-slot technology into the U.S. in 1986. Cross-slot leaves residue directly over the seedbed rows with almost no in-row soil disturbance, and Saxton conducted much of the research into adopting the technology for extremely dry conditions faced by no-tillers in the northwestern U.S., and the prairie provinces of Western Canada. Before his death, no-till pioneer David Brandt was working to launch a farmer-led learning center. While an effort is now underway to bring his vision to life, a group of no-tillers are hosting an event at the Cincinnati Mound Center in southern Wisconsin on September 14th. Jay Brandt, Rick Clark, Lauren Steinlage, and Jimmy Emmons will give presentations. There will also be interactive discussions about soil health and an overview of how Brandt's vision for a learning center can become reality. So all farmers are welcome to attend. Register by September 7th at Cincinnawa.org. That's S-I-N-S-I-N-A-W-A dot org. All right, it's time to start thinking about those cover crops for fall and beyond. Cover crop correspondent McCain Vogel checks in with an alternative species to consider this year and this week's Cover Crop Connection. Thanks, Noah. McCain Vogel here, assistant editor for Cover Crop Strategies. Last week, I attended a field day hosted by the Michael Fields Agricultural Institute in East Troy, Wisconsin. I had the opportunity to learn from one of their research agronomists, Esther Dererej, who told us about her research trials looking into alternative cover crops, including buckwheat. So buckwheat is grown as a cover crop. It really um, comes up pretty quickly, but it's very sensitive to heat. You will see the leaves are dripping down like, you know, so it's sensitive to heat, it's sensitive to drought, it's, uh, it's a pretty sensitive crop, but then it grows pretty well quickly and then covers the ground for you. So it prevents erosion, it competes with the annual weeds, the perennial weeds. You'll see that there's not much weeds at all in the crop, right? Like it's all the same, we grew, but you can see the weeds here, that is there's no weeds at all. So it grows pretty quickly. Um, and then it's ready for uh, incorporation in 35 days. It produces the highest biomass within 35 to 45 days. Uh, the recommendation is to incorporate the, um, terminate the crop seven days after flowering, within seven to ten days, because we don't want to let it go to seed set, because that'll be a problem, then it falls inside. And this is like an indeterminate crop, it keeps flowering, producing seed. Um, so it's very important that you terminate it. Sometimes you can terminate and grow a next crop of buckwheat. People do that, like a couple of crops within a season. So you still have the weed control, you have more biomass coming up and and one of the interesting observations that one um, that Margaret shared with us is like, looked at the amount of uh, honeybees, and then she said the evening bumblebees come, and so like this is for providing flowers for the bees throughout the season. You can just grow a few of those in farms where you want to have those bees. Esther also spoke about sun hemp pearl millet, cowpeas, and more. So stay tuned for coverage on those cover crops in future episodes of the Conservation Ag Update. 
Back to you, Noah. Thank you very much, McCain. Great stuff as always. All right, so the 10th Annual National Strip Tillage Conference in the books, and it featured over 197 first-time attendees, one of whom was Eric Reed, and he is the star of this week's Farmer Feature. Eric grows corn, soybeans, and cotton on the Tennessee-Alabama border. On soil that's as red as can be, he says. He hasn't been growing corn for very long, but with limited resources and minimal experience, the first-generation farmer still managed to increase his yields dramatically over a couple years, including a 100 bushel per acre bump. He made the long drive up north to the National Strip Tillage Conference to share his story during a classroom presentation, teaching others how to achieve similar success in less than ideal conditions. Of course, we don't farm a terrible lot of acres, but I'm on a limited budget. And I didn't have, you know, expensive strip till machines and whatnot, so we made what we had work for us. We had inline rippers. I said, well, let's use those inline rippers as strip till rigs and um, go with that. So that's what we've done. We started implementing those things and we started fighting things like compaction, you know, right hybrid on the right soil planter set up, da da da, just, just the whole the whole works. And uh, man, things just started falling in place. And uh, we're, we're a five time NCGA champion there. Um, several different classes. And this is all dryland stuff. I own the Alabama dryland record to date, uh, 316 bushel. Hasn't been touched, touched in three years. And of course, be on the lookout for Eric's full presentation coming soon to striptillfarmer.com. There's a new specialty grain that's showing promise as a dual-purpose perennial crop. It's called Kernza, and agroecologist Nicole Tauchis says it represents the dream of having a perennial crop that produces food for humans. We see a lot of acres going out of production. They're being bought up and planted into conservation plantings, so they're taken out of production. Essentially, they're not producing food for humans. And what I love about Kernza is that we can do both. We can have our working lands in conservation cover, in perennial cover, they're providing a haven for biodiversity and ground nesting birds and insects, um, but they're also still producing a food crop for humans, which is great. So I think it's kind of the next stage in what has historically been some antagonism between like conservation and agriculture movements. And I think Kernza offers and other perennial grains offer the opportunity to do both on all of our working lands. She says Kernza is the first perennial grass undergoing domestication and commercialization in the U.S. Let's wrap up with our video of the week. A farewell to the John Deere moldboard plow. A goodbye that certainly been a long time coming for all of you conservation-minded farmers out there. The last plow sold was on display at the Minnesota Farm Fest last week, as captured here by Leighton Farms on TikTok. Since its start in 1837, John Deere has been the major manufacturer of moldboard plows, but that came to a halt when the company's last seven-bottom 3710 plow rolled off the assembly line back in February. End of an era. All right, that'll do it for today's episode. Story ideas, send me an email, nnewman at lespub.com. For all the latest features and headlines, head to notillfarmer.com. Thanks for watching Conservation Ag Update. I'm Noah Newman. Have a great day.